Hello, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Rothery, Professor of Planetary Geosciences here at the Open University, and we're coming to you from the Open Science Laboratory. And this is a webcast for students of S283, our Level 2 Planetary Science course, to which we've invited learners on the Open University Future Learn MOOC. Hi, chaps. And uh, with me on my right is my colleague, Dr. Mahesh Anand. Hello everyone, um, hello to all S283 students, our Moon MOOC learners, our past and future OU students. For the next 45 minutes or so, Dave and I will be taking in your questions and we will also be taking some live questions and trying to answer those to the best of our abilities. We'll do our very best. I should have said I am the uh, module team chair of S283 and I'm also the lead educator on the uh, on the Moon's MOOC, which is why I've tried to bring those two communities together. If you'd like to ask us a question live, it's best if you do it using the questions tab, which you should see on your screen. You may need to scroll down to reveal the window where you type a question. I'm just going to type question in there, and you should see that appearing. So that's how you would ask, uh, ask us a question. So, so please do that. We'll keep a look out for live questions. But there have been plenty of questions sent in in advance as well. Let's just tell you a little bit about ourselves, though, so you know who we are. I've told you what I'm teaching. Research-wise, I'm doing a lot of work on the planet Mercury. I'm involved in the European Space Agency's mission to Mercury, which is Bepi Colombo, which is launching 2017. It should start doing science at Mercury in 2024. Until then, I'm working with data from Messenger of a NASA mission, which had a very successful four-year orbital campaign about Mercury, and that's produced some great stuff. Mercury is far more interesting than I, uh, than I expected it to be. And um, um, I am a lunar scientist, and uh, I work on lunar samples that were mostly collected by the Apollo astronauts uh, during those Apollo missions. And today I have brought in some of those samples to uh, share them with you. Um, and to begin with, I would like to show you um, these small pieces of uh, an Apollo sample called uh, 15555 which was collected by Apollo astronaut um, Davy Scott. And um, what a coincidence, this piece has come from a rock that is called Great Scott. And what a surprise. <laughs> uh, the, the original piece actually weighed um, about nine kilograms, and it was one of the biggest pieces of lunar basalt collected uh, from the moon. Uh, in addition to these uh, lunar samples, uh, we work on meteorites because we are interested in understanding the solar system. We are uh, interested in understanding how planets form and evolve. And I thought I might also um, show you some of the meteorites that actually uh, we uh, teach you in our course S283 in case you are uh, one of our S283 students. So as you know, the meteorites are divided mainly in three main classes, stones, irons and stony irons. And here I have in my hand um, an example of a stony iron meteorite where you see those metallic bits uh, which are uh, very shiny and then you have got beautiful green colored olivine which are silicate bits. So uh, this particular meteorite is called uh, palasite which is believed to have come from a crust mantle boundary of a planet-sized body. And then I have an example of a stony meteorite, which also contains some iron, but not as much as you saw in the previous case. Uh, but if you can see, you may be able to discern some uh, circular features, which are called chondrules, and that's why this rock gets its name from. It's called a chondrite. So th th these are some of the um, planetary material that actually are made available to us for free to work in the lab and we as scientists actually work on these um, to learn something about the solar system. That Apollo 15 sample that you've got, anybody who's done the Moon's MOOC or is currently studying it, we, prov we provide a link to the Mazursky lecture that Dave Scott gave in Houston 18 months ago. You and I were both there, and it was a wonderful lecture, wasn't it? It was <laughs> terrific, and, and I found it uh, truly inspirational. And um, every time I look at these samples, I feel that I'm so privileged to be working on these uh, precious samples. Yeah, and although some of these Apollo astronauts weren't primarily geologists, a lot had been so well trained, they were very keen to get good stuff for geologists, and Dave Scott tells a story about 
they were ordered back to the lunar module in the lunar rover and he, he, he saw a wonderful rock and he, he, he made like his seat belt needed refastenings. Please stop while I sort my seat belt <laughs> out. <laughs> and while they were doing that, he leaned <laughs> over and picked up this wonderful vesicular basalt, the seat belt basalt. It's a, it's a great yeah. town. Yeah. Uh, there's always stuff going on in planetary science. So before we go to the questions, Mahesh, what stories have caught your attention in the past few months? Well, um, a couple of uh, news stories, really. Um, the first one is about the results coming from the Rosetta spacecraft. Mm -hmm. As you know, the European Space Agency sent this spacecraft to go around the comet 67P, and that also tried to land a small lander called Philae Lander. And in fact, some of the components on that lander were built here at the Open University. Well, and it did land successfully. Uh, it did. Three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get uh, three for the price of one, yeah. you know, so. Uh, uh, it bounced. It, it, it bounced, but, uh, but it was a, uh, it is already a hugely successful mm. mission. And, and what caught my attention are these uh, latest results uh, that were uh, published recently and were in the news that uh, the Rosetta spacecraft actually detected uh, molecular uh, oxygen coming out of this comet, which was totally unexpected. Uh, and, and, and this yeah. is puzzling scientists uh, a great deal at the moment. This is oxygen that was entrapped as bubbles of oxygen inside the ice and is escaping as the ice sublimes away. It's not being manufactured now from oxygen atoms, is it? I mean, uh, I mean it, it, it's not so easy to answer this question because, uh, first of all, this comet is ancient. This comet yeah. formed at the birth of at the time when the solar system was born at four and a half billion years ago, and any molecular oxygen that was present at that time should have combined with hydrogen mm -hmm. to form water, and that water was then locked into water ice. Yeah. So the f the fact that actually molecular oxygen is coming out from this comet today tells us that either this oxygen is somehow being released from inside the comet, or there is some sort of photochemistry that is going on perhaps that the water is being split into its component and that's what we are seeing. But right now, we don't know what the real answer is. If you split water, you get atomic oxygen and you've got to stick them together to get molecular. Well, what a mystery. Well, Any, anything else? Um, something else that I thought was worth uh, mentioning was a paper that was published a couple of days ago about the possibility that the um, uh, one of the Martian uh, moons, Phobos, is uh, ultimately going to disintegrate or perhaps crash into Mars itself. And it's not going to happen anytime tomorrow or next week, but it's relatively soon in geological terms in the next 20 to 40 yeah. million years. I think it's old news that Phobos's orbit is decaying, but the new work decreases the time it's got left That's by an right. order of magnitude or something. That's right, and I yeah. think they have taken a few other uh, new pieces of information into into account in terms of density, porosity, etc. Yeah. Of, of Phobos. How about you? Well, like most of the world, I think I was captivated by. Um, the New Horizons spacecraft when it flew past Pluto and Charon, uh, the, the wonderful large moon of Pluto. And um, Pluto's got an amazing surface. Part of it is very ancient, but there's very young areas with nitrogen, um, methane and carbon monoxide ice, which is very weak ice, and it's flowing in a glacier-like fashion across this rock-hard substrate of, of, of frozen water ice. Wonderful world, and Charon is almost as beautiful too. And then more recently, we've had um, Cassini, the probe that's orbiting Saturn, flying through the active plumes erupted from the south polar region of Enceladus, small moon of Saturn. And we're all waiting to hear whether it's detected molecular hydrogen, because H2 ought to be released by water-rock interactions, where the water's drawn into the warm rock and comes back out. But there's the silica particles found in the plume already, um, so they're probably inherited from water-rock interaction. If we find H2 as well, then that'll be a great sign that are, but there's genuine water-rock interaction and all the right chemistry there for life to get a hold of. You could have methanogenic organisms oh. taking the methane, uh, the carbon that's there and bonding it with the, some of them at molecular hydrogen and turning it into methane, and that's a met metabolic pathway. Well, that would well, be great well, if you could see that that had the potential to be occurring there. What an exciting time for yeah. uh, planetary Ab science. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's time to um, go on to some, some questions there. 
So um, we've had some questions sent in in advance. I can see some live questions coming, which is great. But let's take one we had in advance for now. Uh, Mary Ann Camp, who's a learner on the Moon's MOOC, is, is saying there may be water on the Moon, but how hard will it be to extract? Well, it's a very good question. Um, I think the answer is uh, uh, not clear at the moment, uh, but at least we know that there is water on the moon. And, and the fact that there is water on the moon uh, tells us that we need to develop uh, ways and technologies to actually be able to extract this moon when we get to the moon. And right now, there is a lot of research that is going on here mm. on Earth to actually uh, simulate those uh, technological processes that might be able to extract water uh, once we get to the moon. And will the water be used primarily for humans to drink or will it be used as some kind of rocket fuel? <laughs> well, that, that, that itself is a, is, is a great question. However, first we need to establish how much of water is there, yeah. uh, how easy it is to extract in a form that is suitable for uh, human consumption. Um, I feel that uh, the first application or the first use of that water that we actually gather on the moon will be for uh, consumption, okay. uh, uh, followed by, in a longer term, to produce rocket fuel by splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, it, it will be a way to uh, reduce the burden that you actually you have to carry stuff from the Earth to the moon. And, and less weight you carry, less cost it is to get to the moon. And also, once you get water from the moon, you can then make sure or you can ensure that at least there is water for survival. And then that water may also be useful for uh, a rocket fuel. Okay. I think there is a question for you, Dave. Yep. And um, th this question is uh, from Karsten Ilkman, who asks, uh, he's another moon's MOOC learner, and he wants to ask a question about uh, shepherd moons. And he says that, how do shepherd moons exist on the inside of ring systems? Uh, I thought the reason for rings is that the material orbits inside the planet's Roche limit, which prevents it from aggregating and forming on the, the moon. If that is the case, why doesn't the shepherd moon also disintegrate into a ring? Okay. What Karsten is saying is correct, that the, the Roche limit is a distance from a planet at which a body made of rock or ice will experience a sufficiently different tidal force in its near side and its far side, but its internal strength won't be able to, won't be able to hold it together, so it will get pulled apart by tides. So a large body will be pulled apart. Now here's what, why can you have shepherd moons inside a ring system? Well, if you think about what a ring system is, rings are made of lumps as well. So if you pursue that argument, the lumps should keep breaking apart so you've got nothing left but atoms. But that doesn't happen. Below a certain size, the tidal differential on near side and far side isn't sufficient to rip anything apart. I mean, I've got a picture here, if we can sh show what's on my screen. Um, this is the moon uh, Daphnis orbiting within one of the gaps in Saturn's rings. We can get a bit closer in uh, here. There it is, if you can see the cursor, right down there. That's Daphnis, uh, a moon that's only a few kilometres across. Um, that hasn't been ripped apart. It's been able somehow to survive and hold, hold itself together. But the thing about the Roche limit is it's not a fixed limit. It does depend on the strength of the, uh, of, of the materials. You put a large body as close to Saturn as Daphnis is, it would break apart. Right. So I, I wonder if the concept of Roche limit is, is somewhat confusing, that actually it's not a boundary, a discrete boundary, where instead it is some sort of a zone that extends for it, it's, some it's, distance. It's a fuzzy boundary, but I think the term Roche limit is so ingrained in the literature and in people's minds that it, it, it's, so, it's open to misinterpretation because, because of that. Right. <laughs> well, while, while you were yeah. answering that question, Dave, I was having a quick look at the <laughs> questions coming in, uh, and they are coming thick and fast, so I think we will be yeah. uh, well, Can I ask you that gravity anomaly question? Well, you can try. I think <laughs> you might be better placed to answer that question. So. D Pike 866, I don't know if you're um, Moon's MOOC or S283. The gravity anomalies on the Moon are much greater than those on the Earth. Is, is that true? How are these gravity anomalies accommodated by the current theory for the origin of the Moon? 
the, what a novelist is thinking of. <laughs> so I, I think he is probably talking about the results from the recent Grail mission. Yeah. Um, and although I'm not an expert on the gravity anomalies on the moon, uh, because this question is related to the theory about the origin of the moon, I think all we can say is that if you have paid attention to last two or three weeks, there have been a couple of papers that have come out discussing different uh, possibilities for the origin of the moon. So in a way, the origin of moon itself is not a settled business. And then to use that to go about explaining the gravity anomalies, I think it's a, it's a very difficult. Yeah. The gravity anomalies I'm aware of are more to do with the crustal structure on the moon. So that doesn't take us back to the moon's origin. We've got positive gravity anomalies where the lunar maria are, but that's because the crust has been thinned and the mantle has risen towards the surface for a process called isostasy. So you've got a mass excess under the maria. And Grail famously discovered linear gravity anomalies around the Procolarum basin, and those are the dikes that have been fitting magma up to, to flood um, the lunar seas. That's right, and they were so related to extensional uh, features, in fact. Yeah, um, but none of this is as early as the origin of the moon. So I think the short answer is that gravity anomalies don't tell us about the moon's origin, but more about its uh, subsequent geological history. That is quite true, that, yeah. but I thought that maybe the, the person asking the question was also hinting towards what happened to the lunar magma ocean, how the mass was distributed in the mantle and the core, and subsequently whether that had any influence okay. on the gravity distribution. So as I said, this is uh, a question for somebody who really works yeah. on Grail data. I don't, we don't know the answer to that. Sorry, D Pike 866. We've got another one we want to answer here. I think there is one about going to the moon and the manned mission. It says, when do you estimate <laughs> the next manned mission to the moon will be? And uh, do you think there will be ever a manned mission to other moons in the solar system? So I cannot try to answer that, but maybe, Dave, The next manned mission to the moon. The Chinese could do it in two years' time. I don't think they'll be that soon but they're clearly ramping up towards it. They've had pretty heavy landers on the moon. Their next step will be to land something and take off and bring samples back to Earth. Right. So They've got the lift capacity. So if somebody doesn't do it within 10 years, I think I'd be surprised. What about you? Yeah, I, I think 10 years is about the right time frame. I thought you said two years. They could do it in two <laughs> years. I don't think they'll be that quick. Right. So Will it be the Chinese? I think if I have to put my money on it, I would say yes, it will be a Chinese space agency because they are very serious about exploring uh, the moon uh, and then following that up with the exploration of the rest of the solar system. And I know that they have plans to land uh, a lander onto the moon in two years' time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they have plans to follow that up with a human exploration. Now, European Space Agency also has ambitions to um, uh, send humans uh, to the moon, although I wouldn't uh, put my bet on <laughs> sending humans from Europe in the next 10 years. But at least there is that ambition. And in fact, I'm involved in some of the mission concept studies that are looking at uh, not human missions to the moon, but actually landing in polar regions of the moon to bring samples back. Well, you're also involved in Lunar Mission 1, aren't you? And there perhaps people watching who've helped crowdfund that. I mean, we have, we have the money to start the that, serious phase of study. That, that's right, but that mission also is to land in a polar region yeah. of the moon and to drill a, a, a big a drill hole to deposit the human archive and then in return to bring that material back to the Earth for scientific reasons. So, yeah. so I think in short the answer is that it is quite possible that we will see humans returning to the moon in the 10 years, but who that will be remains to be seen. Okay. So Let's shall we take... Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I have a question for you, Dave, here. So Lynn A. asks a question. Why aren't the planets of the solar system tidally locked to the sun? Is it because the distances involved are much greater than for moons and the planets they orbit? Okay, well, Lynn is presumably realizing that most moons are tidally locked to their planets. So that as they ro orbit the planet, they rotate once and keep the same face towards the planet. That's because of a strong tide the, uh, any moon experiences from its planet. Now, planets going around the sun 
are relatively further away, so the tidal forces they experience are less, and the tidal force from the Sun on planets isn't sufficient to slow their rotation down, so they rotate only once. Some exoplanets around other stars are really close and are probably tidally locked. Mm -hmm. We used to think that Mercury, which is the nearest planet to the Sun, was tidally locked. It became clear in the mid-1960s, but it's not tidally locked. It rotates three times for every two orbits around the Sun. Um, that's, that is, a, that is a, an effect of tides. It's mm -hmm. a three to two spin orbit coupling. And the effect of that is that its day is twice as long as its year. It's, uh, it's quite confusing when you, when you just said that. You said three rotates for two three rotations for two orbits. Two orbits. So that's one and a half rotations for one orbit. If you rotate twice in an orbit, you get one day a year. If you rotate one and a half times in an orbit, you don't get. You only get half a day in a year. That sounds bizarre. It is. We made a video to show how this works. So right. let's let's run the video. It's about sixty seconds long. Let's let's take a look. Sixty second adventures in astronomy. Number four: A day on Mercury. No two planets act exactly the same, whether it's Jupiter spinning in only 10 hours, Venus spinning backwards, or Uranus tilting to one side. But Mercury is particularly strange. It takes nearly 59 Earth days to rotate, which might make for a pretty long day, but at least you'd have time to get things done. But while the days are long on Mercury, the years are relatively short. It travels around the Sun in just 88 Earth days. Now, until 1965, we thought Mercury span exactly once per orbit, which would mean that one side of it was always facing the Sun. If it spanned twice every orbit, its day would be the same length as its year, which would at least make calendars nice and simple. But it actually spins three times for every two orbits, which means each Mercury day lasts for two Mercury years. So while you might get a bit bored waiting for the evening, at least you'd be able to celebrate your birthday twice a day even if you had to share it with everyone else. Well, I hope that helped. Um, we had a lot of fun making that. It's part of a series of 60 Second Adventures we did. Um, Mahesh, question that came in via Twitter from Robin James. He says, what would a moon base give us that a space station can't? What a wonderful question. Um, I think the the answer can be very long, but I will try to just focus on a few important uh, aspects. Um, b before I answer that, let me, let me just state that actually International Space Station has uh, been uh, tremendously successful in, in giving um, astronauts an experience in, in the space uh, where the space is confined, uh, where there is no gravity, and if human beings ever wanted to explore the rest of the solar system, they have to go to far off places, live off the land, and live in very confined spaces. So from that point of view, ISS has been great. However, if you go to another planetary body, you are going to experience gravity, something that you don't experience on ISS. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't know how the human body would respond to reduced gravity. And for that, you need to go to places like the moon, which is our nearest celestial object, mm -hmm. which also provides you the, the confines of a space and the, um, the distance that you need uh, to feel like you are on your own and you got to survive. Uh, secondly, the moon is a natural planetary body. ISS is an artificial a structure created by human beings. So when you go to the moon, you've got to live off the land, you have resources on the moon that you have to make use of. Yeah. And, and from that point of view, the ice and the water and all those things come into the picture. So because the moon is a natural body, you have to treat it like you treat our own Earth. You have to learn how to live off the land there. Then third point is, that because Moon is a planetary object about which we know something about from the Apollo missions, from remote sensing observations, etc., by going there for a longer period of time, by building Moon bases, we are in, you know, it is, it is inconceivable that we will come back from the Moon without bringing some Moon rocks back. And if we bring some Moon rocks back, we are going to learn more about the Moon and based on that, we are not only going to learn about the moon, but also about the rest of the solar system. So I think all in all, building a base on the moon, exploring the moon, 
gives us a lot more information than we get by just exploring or you know, doing the ISS. Sure, but Buzz Aldrin says we should forget the moon and go to Mars. Uh, is he right? I think he is partly right. We should go to Mars and why not elsewhere? Uh, you know, wh why should Mars be our ultimate destination? Uh, but forget the moon, I'm not so sure about because moon can teach us a lot. Uh, moon is near to the Earth. In fact, tonight when I was coming in here, I saw a beautiful moon just up in the sky, almost looked like I could touch it. Uh, it's nearly full moon. And so it is, th the point is it is so close that we can reach there within a few days and then come back. Whereas to go to Mars, it is still takes several months. Uh, we don't know how the uh, human um, biology actually uh, would interact with yeah. the space radiation, et cetera, for that period of time. So I think going to Mars is still far off. Uh, we must not forget the moon. We should make use of the moon to reach to other destinations. Okay, right. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's time to take another question. Okay. Right? And I have a question for you, Dave, uh, which is from... Um, Deborah McBean, who is uh, asking about these weird features on uh, series ah. that have been revealed by Dawn Mission recently. Yeah. Would you like to talk about that? Uh, yes, sure. Um, as the Dawn Mission was approaching series, which is the biggest asteroid, isn't it? It saw uh, white spots on the surface. Mm -hmm. We've now got these in great detail. If you go, if you look at my screen, you will you'll see this. So these weird white spots, there's a, in the middle of that crater there, the central peak is covered in white deposits and there are white spots um, sort of in, in the two o'clock direction from it as well. And people were thinking, is this exposed ice? Mm -hmm. I think that's been largely ruled out. It might be salt deposits. We're not at all sure. Um, here it is on, on a topographic map of, of what shaded topographic relief model of the crater all these really weird white patches we haven't got an answer yet mm -hmm. um, some kind of salt which doesn't necessarily mean sodium chloride it's probably not sodium chloride magnesium sulfate or something but we don't know yet i think the idea of it being fresh ice um, has gone down the list of probabilities but but it's it a great question and uh, do, do you think this is something that is freshly exposed as opposed to being there for millions or billions of years well, very often bright white stuff is freshly exposed ejecta, which will space weather and become darker with age. But this is in a very ancient crater. Um, I'd be very surprised if some impactor had scored a bullseye on its central peak and then hit elsewhere in the crater as well to give all those little white spots. So I think it's something driven from the inside of, of Ceres. Okay. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility that Ceres is, is, is rock in the middle, but very dirty ice on the outside and um, very salty ice as well due to water-rock interactions. Uh, well, why don't we go from a place where ice is suspected to where we think ice is definitely present, which is Europa. Um, yeah. And I have a question for you here from um, Cynthia Coombe, who asks a question about Europa. And uh, the question is, much is made of extension features on the surface of Europa. However, no mention is made of opposing features such as subduction. Presumably, Europa isn't growing in size, so something must be going on. Uh, yes. Well, Europa has a surface where most of the globe is it's described as a ball of string terrain. It's ridge after ridge after ridge, or double ridges, and it's where we think that the cracks opening and closing all the time. And that's what gives you the pattern on the surface of Europa that is broken up where the ball of string textured surface has separated into rafts, which have drifted obviously into some open space, which is then frozen behind them. You can see that on my screen now. You'll see the, the ball of string terrain. Um, top left is all ball of string terrain, but as you go over to the right, you see isolated rafts of ball of string terrain within this really jumbled chaotic matrix, which has been refrozen. So, so that is what Cynthia is saying. If, you, if you're doing this, you're seeing surface spreading apart, but you must be destroying surface as well in order to allow these things to drift apart. Well, the area that these rafts of ice are drifting into has been melted perhaps and sunk so so 
you've destroyed some surface before you've drifted into it and refrozen. So that's one way of keeping the balance. Now, on Earth, we also have subduction where one plate dives below another. Right. We don't really see that on Europa. There is something hypothesized that's similar called subsuction. And did you meet Louise Proctor when she was here a few months ago? She was talking to us about it. If you go to, the, go to my screen now, here is, um, it's very complicated. But the idea is that on the left is the present surface of Europa with some terrains colour coded. Um, and there are regions where the surface seems to have disappeared and you can, you can, you can move it around and talk about these subsuction processes where bits, wraps, plates of ice go below the surface. I'm not fully convinced of this mm -hmm. yet, but there's certainly more than one way that you can destroy the surface of Europa to allow it to move apart give these tidal ridges and to give the chaos areas where rafts have drifted into somewhere. Very good question. We certainly don't think Europa or any planetary body is expanding very greatly. Right. Great. Thanks, Dave. So yeah. I think um, I think I've keeping let me give you a question. Yeah, sure. Oh <laughs> do you think it would be right to reclassify the moon as a planet? You work on the moon. Would you like to be a planet? And that would make it part of a double planet with the Earth. This is from um, Janet de Mulder. OK, I think uh, you probably are more passionate about uh, reclassifying <laughs> or classifying planets. My frank answer would be that um, I just want to work on the moon. I want to go to the moon, and I want to have moon rocks. I really don't mind what it is called, whether it's called a planet or it's called the moon. Coming to the scientific reasoning, we know that our moon is relatively large compared to its planet which it orbits in the solar system. That's not that common. Now, is, is that characteristic sufficient enough to classify it as a, as a planet? Uh, the argument is where the center of mass is, I understand. That as the moon drifts further away, the center of mass of the two bodies will eventually be beyond the Earth's surface, and that's when people say it should be a double planet. But at the moment, the center of mass, the barycenter, is still inside the Earth. Inside so the Earth, yeah. The moon goes round the Earth just like Titan goes round Saturn. It's so so it, it, yeah. it, you know, I, I don't have any problem <laughs> in being it a moon, and uh, you know, even though it's moving away from, from the Earth, and so presumably that um, center uh, of mass of Earth-Moon system is going to shift with time, but that is still is not going to be appreciable enough to warrant reclassification. What is it, two centimeters a year or something? It's drifting away. It's, yeah. it's not going to happen for not in a long, lifetime. long time. Yeah. I mean, Pluto and Charon have a barycenter which is between the two of them. It's in free space above the surface of, of Pluto. So that means Pluto and Charon are a, a double dwarf planet. Dwarf planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. To go with that classification. Yeah, yeah. good. Right. Okay. Um, Shall uh, we take another life question okay. uh, here, which I thought was uh, well. I think we already tackled the the moon gradually drifting away uh, from the Earth, uh, and there is another question here on uh, water on the moon, which says if there is uh, a large enough supply of water on the moon, and we can develop an efficient extraction process, that's a big leap forward for moon habitation. But there are other challenges, obviously. So could it really happen? Well, um, space exploration is um, a risky business. Yeah. Uh, nothing is certain. Uh, you plan missions for 10 years, 20 years, and, and yet it might not happen. But that's what keeps us engaged. That's what keeps us uh, excited, I guess. Um, I think if we can uh, derive water on the moon through um, uh, in situ uh, methods, then I think that's a big leap forward. And the next um, next task will be to to build a, a base, um, a habitat, uh, using the local resources. So I think we we have to take uh, make these progress uh, incrementally. It's not going to happen uh, everything all together, but unless we start in the smallest steps, we will never, you know, make our uh, dreams realize. Okay. Related question that came in um, in advance from Roland Lemmers is how much heavier is the water on them? I mean, it's heavy water. Um, it's 
you can perhaps tell us what that is. Too much heavy water and it couldn't be used for drinking, he says. So is the lunar water worth having if it's heavy water? Well, let, let's fl first explain to our um, audience what uh, is heavy water. Right? So hydrogen has two isotopes. One is hydrogen, uh, which has um, got um, one proton, and it has got another isotope called deuterium, which has got a proton and a neutron. And it's called uh, deuterium, and the symbol is D. And usually heavy water contains uh, two deuterium atoms for every one oxygen atom. And so its um, formula is D2O, whereas formula for regular water is H2O, right? Yep. And we all are familiar with use of heavy water in nuclear reactors, for example, for thermalizing neutrons. However, the water on the moon is not all D2O. It's far from it. So yes, there is some deuterium present on the moon which is relatively more compared to what we have on Earth. So for every hydrogen atom, or let's put it other way, for every deuterium on the Earth, we have several thousands and thousands and thousands of hydrogen. Likewise on the moon, perhaps we have a few thousand less hydrogen for every deuterium. So it's not that heavy. It's not that okay. heavy. So I think the chances that we will be drinking heavy water and then it will be harmful to human beings is is, is not okay there. Great. While you were talking, I rebooted and reconnected to the Wi Fi and that where some more live questions come in. And there's one here from Keely Marie Snellgrove. Further to recent images of Pluto and Sharon, are there likely to be other, likely to be other Kuiper Belt missions? Um, well, the, the New Horizons mission hasn't finished. Uh, 1st of January 2019, it will fly by its second target, which is a Kuiper Belt object discovered only a couple of years ago and it's about 40 kilometres radius and they hope to have that filling the frame of the camera at closest approach so that's going to be really good. That itself is a new mission. That's an extended mission for New Horizons <laughs> yeah. but a new mission launched from Earth to the Kuiper Belt um, I'm not aware of any planned yet. The, the, the outer solar system missions I'm aware of um, are uh, JUICE, the Jupiter IC Satellite Explorer that um, the European, e European Space Agency that. will send to the Jupiter system. Uh, NASA is going to send the Europa Clipper to study Europa as well. There's a lot of impetus for another mission to Enceladus to go f study the plumes with something that will look for organic materials, traces of life. Because if there is life in Enceladus' ocean, it's being vented to space That's for right. free. Yeah, dead that microorganisms. That, that mission has not yet That's been. That's not yet been approved. Yeah. Uh, and that's it for the yeah. outer solar system. We, we need to go to Triton again, Neptune's moon. We need to see the other halves of Uranus's moons. But it takes a long time to get there, and nobody wants to fund that at the moment. We need to go to Pluto with an orbiter. Because when New Horizons got there, it was traveling really fast. That's it right. was a short trajectory. Was it? N eight? nine and a half years from Earth to Pluto, but it couldn't stop, it just had to whiz by. Yeah, yeah. Next I mean, I, I was orbit. amazed when I, when I read that actually New Horizons would have reached the moon within a few minutes or, or half an hour or something like that. Whereas we know that <laughs> it, you know, it took three days for Apollo astronauts to get to the moon. So that's how fast it was traveling. And, and we mustn't forget that it's not the outer solar system. We are also interested in exploring the inner solar system. And of course, you told us that you are involved in the um, forthcoming European Space Agency yeah. mission. Of, uh, Somebody asked me to, to talk about that, didn't they? Yes, I think there was a question. Um, yeah, Margarita McElroy says, I'm fascinated by the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury. Can you speak about it? Yes, I can. I'm the lead co-investigator on the only instrument on Bepi Colombo that's led by the UK, which is an X-ray spectrometer, which will map the surface of Mercury in X-rays. The sun illuminates Mercury, it fluoresces X-rays back, and the characteristic energies of X-ray emission correspond to each element. And we will get maps of the dozen, 16 most abundant elements. But mm -hmm. Bepi Colombo will also image the surface invisible, near infrared, thermal infrared, which NASA's message mission didn't. It will study the magnetosphere, study the exosphere, the, 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 the charged species and the neutral species surrounding Mercury in space or study its gravity field, because Mercury is a really weird planet. It 
just a glance at it, it's airless, it's cratered, you think it looks like the moon, but it doesn't have dark patches like the moon does. In fact, it's all dark. Mm -hmm. It's all made of basalt. There's no anorphosite, no flotation crust such as the moon has. It's all dark. Some of it is very ancient, but a lot of it is flooded by um, lava flows which are younger than the late heavy bombardment, so they have relatively few craters. And there are thrusts where the surface has been thrust over itself, because we're talking about Europa not changing its volume. Mercury has been shrinking. It's shrunk by about seven kilometres in radius in the past three and a half billion years. And where, it's, where the shrinkage has taken place, you get thrusts, mm -hmm. low bit scarps. Low bit scarps, yeah. One bit thrust over another. And then we've got explosive volcanism going on. Vents where we can see pyroclastic deposits surrounding them. We found lots of sulfur in the crust from the X-ray spectrometer on Messenger. It's, it's rich in sulfur, it's rich in potassium, it's rich in chlorine, and it's rich in something driving explosive volcanic eruptions. None of that should be happening at Mercury, right. but it's so close to the sun, yeah. it's a weird place. And it's not just fire um, fountaining eruptions or volcanic eruptions, but also ice. There's at ice, the poles. There's ice at the poles, as there is on yeah. the moon. It's, it's cometary ice that's cold, that ends up in cold traps and stays there. And where you've got sunshine on the surface, you've got patches of mercury which are subliming away to space, living these weird hollows. It is an amazing planet. Well, we need to go. We've got maybe time for one or two more questions. Well, I have a question uh, okay. here that is um, being asked by uh, one of our SQA3 students, yeah. um, Daffy uh, Perry. And uh, he asks, well, he describes this as a silly question, but as we know, there is. No, no such no thing, no such such thing silly as a silly question. <laughs> uh, he says, um, sorry, uh, in Ridley Scott's film, Alien, the animal is called a silicon-based life form. What kind of conditions would need to exist on an exoplanet for such a life form to be produced? Although silicates seem common on terrestrial planets, could conditions be such that silicon behaves like carbon? Yeah, well, this is really one for chemists. But silicon is next one down from carbon in the periodic table. It can form four bonds and it can form chains, but they're not as, it doesn't bond as readily with as many different things as carbon does. Uh, at higher temperatures, silicate chains are more stable than, than carbon chains, so maybe a very hot exoplanet. The thing is, if you, do, if you have respiration going on in a carbon-based life form, and you, you will react with oxygen and give off carbon dioxide, which is a gas. Mm -hmm. You have some silicon, some s chains of silicon atoms bonded with something, and you react with oxygen. You produce SiO2, which is silica, which is solid under almost all conditions. So you can't get rid of your metabolic waste. So it might be tricky to have a silicon based life form. No, or I at mean, least, probably, it's fair to say that because we are not familiar with any metabolic process that actually uses silicon. Yeah. That it is hard to say. Or our computers, silicon-based life forms, because they've got silicon <laughs> chips. And we'll, <laughs> when we will go. they become self-aware? <laughs> okay. Not anytime soon, I hope. <laughs> I hope this one does. This one's got a mind of its own. It keeps turning itself up. Right. Did you f uh, come across a question that is coming live to us that you thought we might want We're to? We're being told to finish, but is there any other moon in the solar system, says Mark Turner. Last question, I promise, guys. Any other moon in our solar system apart from Mars suspected of being caused by collision between planetary embryo-sized bodies? Um, the short answer is no, because yeah. we don't have samples from any other moons in the no, solar system. No, we don't. The moons of the giant planets are so much smaller than their planets. They probably formed in accretion disks around them. Unless Sharon, Pluto's moon, formed by embryo-embryo collision. That's a possibility. I'm sure that there is a tremendous possibility of things colliding in the solar system. And we know that things have been colliding in the solar system. But until we have samples in the lab, we can't be as certain as we are for the Earth-Moon system. No. I mean, here's a geochemist speaking. You need samples so you can analyze them, get hold of the isotopes, and look at fractionation processes and fingerprint things. Exactly. And that's yeah. why we must go back to the moon to get some more samples. OK. You heard it here. We must go to the moon for more samples. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks to Mahesh for, for coming along. Thanks to the people behind the camera for running this so ably. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't deal with all your questions. Plenty of questions came in. I was a little bit worried we weren't going to get any. We've had a whole bag full of questions here. We only got through 
less than half of them. But thank you for those. Sorry we couldn't deal with them all. I'd like to do this again round about April time when I'll have a Mars expert uh, sitting next to me. It's not you, Mahesh. You don't have to learn about Mars between now and April. Right. Somebody else. Okay. Um, so hopefully um, I'll see some or all of you uh, again in April. Okay, bye. Thank <music> you.